Welcome to the Tea with Dr. D. My name is Dimitri Daskalakis, or Dr. D, and it's time to eliminate fear and get real about HIV. I am the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of HIV AIDS Prevention and Control in New York City, but for the purposes of the Tea with Dr. D, I am your gay health warrior. We're gonna focus on the mind, body, spirit, and soul of people living with HIV, because people who are living with HIV aren't just living, they're thriving. You're watching The Tea with Dr. D. Welcome to The Tea with Dr. D. I'm Dimitri Daskalakis, or Dr. D. Today, we're going to eliminate fear and get real about HIV. Nearly one million people are living with HIV in the United States, and one in four don't know. Today, we're gonna to talk about testing, stigma, and what it really means to be newly diagnosed with HIV. Today, we're here with Adaranke Ogontoye from the Evolve Psychiatric Services in Manhattan to talk a little bit about HIV and stigma, specifically around race. African-American men and Hispanic men are specifically the people who are experiencing the highest rates of HIV in the United States. Why is that? Well, I think that it's uh, probably a multi-factorial reason, but I do think that one of the most alarming statistics that I was aware of was that uh, Hispanic men and African American men were almost twice as likely as white men to be living with HIV and not know of their infection. I think that that's probably one of the biggest factors, not knowing and sometimes the stigma against then seeking treatment once you do know that you're infected. Right, I think that they're really intertwined, right? Mm -hmm. So the same sort of issues that are barriers to getting tested often get in the way of getting treatment. What are the reasons that you think exist in the community that, that make it hard for African-American, Black and Hispanic men to sort of seek out a test? Some of it is cultural. Mm -hmm. They may be less likely to seek health in general, going for annual physicals in general. And this would obviously be an extension of that same right. neglect. If you are a man who has sex with men, identifying yourself as a homosexual may have a different um, taboo in that community. If they're straight and they have HIV, they may think, oh, that means that you must be gay and that's the reason why you have right. this disease. So that might be another barrier to keep you from going and uh, associating yourself with that population. Right. So what do you think are some strategies we could use to make HIV testing and treatment sort of less high threshold, less of a threat, or less intimidating to specifically black and Hispanic men and, I, and women? I think in general the HIV testing needs to not be considered a separate part of your health screening. Yeah. I think just the same as I would take a fasting blood sugar or you know, your cholesterol level, you should get your HIV screening in the same way because you're here already. You're here already seeing totally. about your health. Yeah. Why wouldn't I see about your full health? So what's the message? What would you say to someone who's listening to us now? Let's say it's a, an African-American or a Hispanic man or a transgender woman. What's the message? What do they need to know about from the HIV perspective? The main thing to know is that you have one body and one life and one health and you need to take it seriously and protect it. And that means that you should get regular health screenings. And if you do get news that you don't want, know that there are other options for you. This is not the same death sentence that it was 30 years ago. There's so much better treatment. Yeah, so one of the things that I think about when you're talking to me today is what I tell people all the time, which is that the only HIV test that you have to be scared about is the one that you never had. Right. Because I mean, in our modern era, if, if you're positive, there's so many things we can do to keep you healthy. Yes. And if you're negative, there's so many things you can do to prevent HIV infection. It's a whole new day. I think you've made a really important point that made me think a bit about the fact that when we make things routine, we also get rid of a lot of the stigma around them. Yeah, after a while it's like, no, they're not asking me because they think anything in particular about me. They're just asking because this is something you ask when you go to the doctor. They ask you if you smoke cigarettes. They ask you if you have unprotected sex. This is part of what doctors ask. That's great. And Adronke, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's such a great point, leaving here thinking, just do it. Yes. Just make it a part of what you do and it's gonna change the entire story for people because you're not stigmatizing them by offering things that you don't offer everybody. Exactly. What a great point. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you. 
I am Tyler Curry, and I always wanted to have a career as a writer. Now, I'm the senior editor of a website called HIV Equal Online. My goal is to showcase people who are living with HIV, but not have HIV be their central storyline, because it's certainly not mine, and to really show a perspective of someone's life in its entirety, and how HIV can fall into your life just like anything else can. I am Tyler Curry, and I am positively not afraid. We're here today with Joe Valentino, a member of the board of GMHC, the Gay Men's Health Crisis, and the publisher of Plus Magazine, the most widely read publication for people who are living with HIV. Joe, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to sit down and have a conversation with you. Excellent. So Plus Magazine is really an important publication. It's at the point of care at so many places. So I know in my experience, having taken care of people living with HIV and working in community-based organizations as well, um, it's one of the publications that you see right at the point of care, whether that's community-based care or medical care. So that's a really important position for a publication. So talk to me about that. What's the responsibility of being this information source for people right where they're seeking care? I think when we first launched the publication, it was really important for me to work with our editors and our team in order to make the information accessible to everyone, whether it was someone with a fifth grade education or someone that had a PhD. So we take the information down and we really kind of water it down so they can be in the know, so they're empowered. So I mean, I think you speak to that population really well in that publication. I'll tell you, as a medical provider, people come all the time and say, oh, I read this in Plus Magazine, and so what do you think about that? So I think that you start conversations. I would love to hear, especially since you're getting feedback from people who are readers, both of this and other publications that you have, sort of what your sense is of young men who have sex with men and HIV. What, what are you hearing? What's going on on the ground? You know, there's a lot of conversation and stigma. You know, there's a whole men who have sex with men, and there's a whole gay, bi, trans, and they're completely different based on your culture and your community, African American or Hispanic men who have sex with men, but also have girlfriends and wives who don't self-identify as gay. So it's something they do on the side, and if they don't know their status, they're, they're not positive, they're not gay, and it's something they don't really have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I think, what is it, one in, one in four, one or five, depending on who's doing the research and how it's being validated, are infected and don't know their status. So what do we do about it from your perspective? Like, I mean, I think you're, you're working so hard to message to people and, and I think so many other people are, are looking at how to sort of reach out to that community. So what's, what do you think our strategy should be together? I think, you know, we're doing things um, from an editorial standpoint. We do something called the Barbershop Diaries. Like for MSN, the barbershop is like church. Like they feel comfortable going to the barber every Sunday at 11 and they'll talk about anything and everything with their, with their, with their barber. And they've had these long-term relationships with them. And just sparking the conversation, I think more people coming out and ripping down the curtain and being like, it's okay, uh, me too. It's manageable. I'm moving on. Don't worry about it. It's it's a virus. It it doesn't have to. It doesn't. You're not. You're not. I. You know. It, it's not your identity. So, and I, I think one of the things that we were talking about, or that you brought up, was not only the issue of men who have sex with men, but the issue of race. And so, what what are the specific challenges that you're perceiving from your perspective? Um, for African American and Latino men. So it seems as if, you know, looking at the statistics, Latinos and blacks make up a very small percentage of the population at large, but a really huge number of the new diagnoses of HIV and those living with HIV in the US. So like, what do you think is going on and what can we do? I think, you know, self-empowerment, if we can do anything to increase their self-esteem, make them feel, you know, accepted regardless of how they choose to identify, would lead them to take you know, the necessary steps in order to want to know their status, protect themselves, and, and, and you know, protect others. I think negative or positive, it all boils down to you know, self-respect. Respect yourself, respect your body, and feel worthy enough to take control and live a productive life. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. My name is Melina Fisher, and I'm originally from Long Island, but now I live in the Bronx. I wake up, I take my dogs to the park, I get my son off the bus, and we either bike ride or just run around, play with water guns. I was a tomboy growing up, so having my son just kind of brought that back out of me. 
I mean, he's the reason I'm still here. He's the reason I smile every day. He's a really good kid and he makes being a parent so much fun and I can't imagine my life without him. My name is Melina and I'm positively in control. We're here today with Octavia Lewis, who's an education specialist at the Hedrick Martin Institute and a really important activist and advocate in the world of HIV and transgender health and equity. Um, I can tell you that I've heard Octavia speak at the Apollo. She's been at NYU, and now we have her at the tea with Dr. D. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, man. So I want to just start off and, and launch into really what your experience has been as a transgender woman mm -hmm. and also as an advocate. So we know that the transgender women, specifically transgender women of color, have really specific challenges that they're up against. And some of them have to do with just basic issues of equity and, and how they support themselves. So rates of unemployment are really high. And no matter what you do like to make ends meet, people have to do what they have to do. Absolutely. And very often that involves sex work and other things that really put them at risk and potentially even a danger. So can you talk to me about that? I'm sure. As a formalized commercial sex worker myself, um, I did it because I needed to put my way through school. At that time, that was the only option I had. It wasn't like people were beating down the door to hire people of trans experience. And especially um, living in the South, um, I'm originally from Georgia, a state which has no protection for people of trans experience, it was hard for me to get a job and live my authentic truth. So this way, it was a form of steady income, but it wasn't safe income. And that's the reality of a lot of women of experience, especially women of color. Mm -hmm. So your experience is not just a firsthand one of a woman of a, of a different gender experience, mm -hmm. but also of someone who's worked in advocacy and in mm -hmm. education. So I would love to get your perspective from that side of the world, which is why, why are there so many challenges for, for trans women and other trans people from the perspective of, of getting tested and then getting connected to care and then more importantly, retained in care and, and keeping their, their HIV meds up so they keep their viral load suppressed? We don't have cultural competent medical providers everywhere. Mm -hmm. And all of us are not fortunate enough to be able to come to a big city. So when you do go to your health care provider, whatever, you know, is there um, in your local area, and you're not even treated as a human. When you go and you tell people, okay, well, this is how I identify. In the South, they still call you by Mr. or Mrs. when you're in the, in the waiting room. Or when you try to use a restroom in the South, they'll be like, oh, you're going to the wrong restroom. So all of those things are traumatic and very triggering. Mm -hmm. So if that is something in which someone faces trying to get medical care in the beginning, why would you think they would return to that? Right. So that's why a lot of people of trans experience are lost to care because we, can, we do not have competent health care providers. So I knew I experienced that. I'm gonna change the subject for a second. Sure. We sometimes don't talk about some specific behaviors that could happen amongst people of different different gender experiences mm -hmm. sort of reach what their gender goal may be, Absolutely. which is sometimes people use hormones or use injectable silicone, mm -hmm. um, not in sort of the traditional medical context like of a dermatologist or plastic surgeon's office or in a endocrinologist or primary care doctor's office, but they, mm -hmm. they do it themselves and sometimes they share needles. Yes. Is that a phenomenon? It's actually funny that you brought that up. Um, I have a dear sister of mine and an advocate. Um, that's how she contracted the virus. She was getting black market hormones, and one of the young ladies um, that gave her a shot one day, she was already HIV positive, mm -hmm. and she gave her a shot from the same needle, and that's how she contracted HIV. And a lot of people think that, oh, you're out there partaking in commercialized sex work. That wasn't her narrative. Right. But yet the end goal was the same. She still contracted HIV. So when we look at all of the nuances, not just one thing or just look at the negative connotation of things, but just look at she just wanted to, again, live her authentic truth. And right. she needed access to those hormones. And she did not have access because at that time she did not have medical coverage. So to go and pay $40 to get a shot of 
life-sustaining and life-altering medications, you're thinking, well, hey, this is a good deal. At least I don't have to worry about going to be misgendered. At least I don't have to worry about being called out. So to go and to get that shot, she was living her truth. But her truth was ultimately her demise as well. And so you're, aside from having a different gender experience, are also coming at this from living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that there are specific challenges among the trans population, and I think you brought them up, but I'd love to get your perspective, which is that there's other stuff that you worry about more than HIV. Mm -hmm. As a mother, yes, sometimes I wonder, am I going to live to see my child graduate from high school? As a mother, and especially a woman of color, I wonder when my child gets older, am I going to worry about having a Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. or a Michael Brown? So yes, those are things that I do worry about, living this life as a woman of color. Um, not adding my experience to it, but just as a person of color. You know, living with HIV and again being a woman of experience, Yes, those are things that are always in the back of my mind. So I think that I would love to pursue that a bit more with you and talk about how does sort of the queer LGBTQ sort of movement to health equity and just equity in general mm -hmm. fit into sort of the bigger plan of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that there's so much resonance and synergy. I'd love to hear your perspective. For me, it is about normalizing it. Unfortunately, some of us that are black we don't make the news media. We're not spoken of. Our narratives are not told. I know that any day that I walk out of my house could be my last. But then I question, who's going to say that my life matter? Who's going to say your life matter at the end of the day? That is something which it does linger in the back of my mind, and not just mine, but other of my trans brothers and sisters. I mean, that's poignant. I mean, I feel that you're a role model by, by being an educator, by being an advocate, and by being an activist, you are a role model. So I'm gonna ask you something, you sure. get the final word. Mm -hmm. So what do you want people to know, whether they're of a different gender experience or if they're meeting people of different gender experiences, mm -hmm. how can they make that change? What's the final word for them? You can make that change by realizing, at the end of the day, we are all human. And once we bring the humanistic standpoint to things, and we look at people as being our equal, and not our inferior, or us not being superior to one another, then that's when things will begin to change. It's when we remove all of, I have this and you don't have that without looking as to, well, hey, maybe you could have those if you did not have those barriers in front of you. So for me, it is about having that empathy. And people get that confused with sympathy. And it is not the same. Mm -hmm. And I think once you can put yourself in that person's shoes and you can truly get the gist of what they're going through, then you will see that, you know what? If only they were given the chance if only they had the opportunity, then what could their life be like? Octavia, on that note, thank you so much for your insight and really teaching us so much. I appreciate your time and being here on The Tea with Dr. D. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. My name is Louis Oyola. I grew up in the Bronx. Came out as being bisexual at the age of 13. I had like a lot of homophobia, a lot of people wanted to fight me because of me being gay, they didn't accept me for being gay. I've been advocating for 11 years. New York is Gotham City, it needs a lot of help. There's a lot of work to be done here. And the only thing that I can do as a citizen is just basically speaking to the people one by one. I'm Louis Sayola and I'm positively caring. Today we have Dr. Mary Travis Bassett, who is the Commissioner of Health at the New York City Department of Health. 
Thanks, Dr. Bassett, for being here today. It's really a pleasure. I want to start off by talking about in the United States, when we think about the HIV epidemic, we're seeing a lot of new infections happening among African-American, Black, and Latino populations or Hispanic populations. So I'd love to get your perspective of, of how race really interacts with the HIV epidemic and what, what really we should do from the equity perspective to start addressing that or to address it better. Right. Well, this is really an important issue. And as you know better than I do, I think about 80% of, of men who are infected are black and Latino. That's right. And about 90% of uh, women. First important point to make is this is not related to the idea of biological susceptibility. Right. Uh, this is more importantly related to the problem of poverty and the problem of disconnection and exclusion. So our task, both in prevention and in treatment, is to ensure that we reach people and that we provide them with access to everything they need to know to be HIV sure, as you've said. If, they're not, if you're not infected, you need to know your status. And if you are infected, you need to be in, in treatment. The other question I have is about the issue of how we can reach the communities without necessarily stigmatizing them in the process of yeah. reaching them. I think it's one of the challenges, especially in mm. HIV, mm. since we're sort of seeing a very clear story of, of black and Latino men, uh, men who have sex with men mm. and women and trans people mm. who, are, who are getting HIV. Mm. But how do we sort of rein it in to sort of make it that they own this intervention without it being a stigmatizing move? Exactly. These are facts. These numbers that you're relaying, you know, the fact that you're more likely to become newly infected if you're black or Latino or you're trans, that you're more likely to be part of the infected population if you're black or Latino, men have sex with men, trans people. These are facts. Mm -hmm. And we all have to engage with facts. But the way in which we do it uh, doesn't need to say that it's because of who you are that you have become infected. It's, that's not the right way to frame it. It's because of your ability to modify your risk, whether you're poor, whether you're discriminated against, and whether you have access to health care. Right. So I, I, th I just want to come back to the conversation that we were having earlier about, um, about the composition of the HIV-infected population in our city and the risk that black and Latinos, regardless of their gender preference, their gender identity, uh, face, and, and talk a little bit about the importance of acknowledging racism mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as something that is, remains unfinished business in our, in our country. And it affects our health. I'm sure from your other guests you've been hearing about it. Regardless of your other identities, if you are of African descent, that is part of your life. This resonates with everything that we've mm. heard um, so far on the tea with Dr. D. A woman of a different gender experience, so a trans woman, African American, a black trans woman, mm. was talking about having um, her son, and mm. that um, though she's concerned about lots of the LGBTQ issues and the sort of trans issues that she faces, um, also being an HIV positive trans woman, mm. she's most concerned about raising a black male in this society. Yes. Well, she has good reason to be concerned. And first of all, I applaud her um, for taking on the challenge of parenting. This isn't just an opinion that black men face terrible odds. It's a fact. Well, I understand why she wants to figure out how to immunize her son uh, and how to help him overcome those odds. It's high blood pressure. It's a risk of violence. It's uh, it's the risk of HIV. Uh, all of these risks uh, we can see through the lens of race. Yeah, and it's, it seems as if one of our key messages today is that um, race is a significant driver. It of is. A lot of, a lot of diseases, not only HIV, but specifically in HIV, and then overlap with, with that, we have issues of homophobia, transphobia, exactly. sexism. Yes. It, it all interplays to create an environment where transmission continues, um, not just because of risk-taking behavior, but just because of context. When you have an identity 
that means that you know correctly the data support this assessment that the odds are stacked against you and you don't control those odds in many important ways, I think it modifies your ability to believe that you control your future. Yeah. And this I is think, yes. speculative, but... I don't think it's speculative. I mean, I think when we think about HIV very often, um, especially in the LGBTQ mm. community, what you'll hear is inevitability. Yeah. And so it's that same yeah, feeling that this is a, an inevitable almost a thing. Pessimism. I can't change the I future. Can, a fatalism. Almost. Exactly. And so I think right. that it's not. I think it's it's exactly resonant. I yeah. think it's the uh, the same comes from the same place. Yeah. You know, I think that we have something to offer in a small way of convincing people that they do control their future by ensuring that they have access to health care, by promoting the idea that you can get into health care by ensuring that people know that they can determine their status. And regardless of which door you walk through after that test, that there are things that we can do. If you're HIV negative, you can figure out how to stay that way. If you're HIV positive, we now know that we can effectively treat people and that they can live lives where they have to worry about their high blood pressure more than their HIV infection. So in a small way, in taking control of that, it's almost an opportunity to take control of your life more generally. And if we can do that, I think that we will have made a contribution to these much bigger, harder issues, like how to tackle racism, how to tackle income inequality. A first step is, is understanding that, that we can control this future. That's great. I was going to ask you for a final word, but I think you already gave me the best final word I could ever even dream of. So well, I, that's why you know I I, um, I went into medicine actually because I I thought all of us want our health, all of us know how important our health is to our lives, and by taking care and control of our health, we maybe are taking the first step towards okay. taking control of our lives. Dr. Bassett, thank you so much for joining us on The Tea with Dr. D. <laughs> thank you, it's been a pleasure. Excellent. Thanks for watching The Tea with Dr. D. Today we've learned several important lessons about testing and stigma. The first is that we need to find people where they're at. What that means is we can't make up what people need. We have to meet them on their own terms. The second really important lesson is stigma is not just about transphobia and homophobia. Racism and poverty are drivers of HIV infection and they need to be addressed as well. And another really important lesson is that taking care of transgender people and young men who have sex with men really requires that we approach their care in an empathetic way and embrace who they are and what they need. I'd like to thank our guest today, Mary Travis Bassett, Adaranke Ogontoye, Octavia Lewis, and Joe Valentino. For more tea on HIV, visit hivplusmag.com or pick up a copy of Plus Magazine. You can also follow Plus Magazine on Facebook and Twitter, both at HIV Plus Mag. And remember, get tested for HIV. Whether the test is negative or positive, you are more than just your status.